Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Shett, episode 491, featuring an interview with one Mr. Evan Robinson. Now, how much would you pay to be able to go back in time and be there at TSR while Gary and Dave were working on the Dungeons and Dragons series and all the other cool stuff like Top Secret? Well, Evan was there. He's got some fantastic stories to tell about what it was like. <laughs> You're just not gonna believe some of the stories he's got about that. But as if that wasn't cool enough, uh, to also have worked, be a veteran of electronic arts back in the really cool days when they were doing super hip and innovative stuff like mail order monsters. Hello. <laughs> so one of my favorites. Uh, and just a ton of other cool stuff. I mean, this guy's got fantastic stories to tell. I think you're really going to enjoy this. Uh, so without further ado, here is Mr. Evan Robinson. Hello, folks. I am here with Evan Robinson. Really excited to to get into it here with Evan. You've done some, you know, just looking at your resume. You know, maybe I'll bring it up here in a minute, but you know, you got you can look at it on LinkedIn, or of course, the <laughs> movie games, I suppose. But you know, you've been in some places that I, you know, I kind of envy you. You know, you're really there at the start of some of the biggest developments ever, really, in the history of the at least computer, or at least the role playing games. I suppose that's true. Um, it, it's it's maybe a little aggrandizing. <laughs> but you ended there um, at TSR. Yeah. You went on to work at a. I guess you were working with Paul Ritchie on Mail Order Monsters. Uh, yes, Paul was. I, I was lead engineer. Paul was the designer on Mail Order Monsters. Uh, really, my wife Nikki Robinson and I were co-engineers. Um, mm. But uh, World yeah, Tour. that was in the old days. World Tour Golf, Centurion, uh, Centurion with Kellen Beck. Uh, that was uh, that was an experience working on the the Sega for the first time while it was still in the clean room. And uh, Kellen is a very different kind of designer from Paul, so it was uh, it, it was a, a different kind of project, but it was still fun. And uh, every once in a while, a couple of years ago, somebody on on uh, uh youtube found our easter egg after i don't know after more than a decade wow somebody actually found our easter egg <laughs> that was fun it was a, a nod to asterisks asterisks and obelix hmm. i'm surprised it took that long it that was, was a little obscure so you had like to hit kind of exactly again the for a right while and then uh went on to do some stuff for Adobe and I did uh, yeah so you've been you've been a lot of cool places a lot of I I there's very little in my career I regret having done and I got to do for the vast bulk of, bulk of my career something I would have been doing if I hadn't been paid for it so yeah I I was really lucky and I was close to the beginning of paper RPGs. I was in, in TSR when it was still pretty small. Uh, I was close to the beginning of computer games. We were, we were out of plastic bags, uh, but we were still, the, the genres were not set and people could do a lot of really different, interesting things. You know, the good old days of the, the Ziploc bags. <laughs> yeah, and, and single person projects. Yeah. Well, let's yeah. uh, start now, off. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go I ahead. Sorry. Say, I know, you know, a lot of people, that, most of the people that watch this show anyway, they're this sort of their main thing is role-playing games and uh, computer role-playing games. But also I think the all the stuff you did at TSR, you, people have probably noticed the the background I've got rocking here. <laughs> I just wonder, you know, I, I was reading uh, some of the interviews you you sent me. It was a pretty fun story about how you got uh, hired on, you know, at TSR, and then even the trip down there proved. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, that was <laughs> that was interesting. Um, this is it, what, 1980, it, I think, is the year. So. Yeah, well, it really, it really starts in late 1979, December 1979. I'd had a terribly bad breakup in college. Oh. And uh, so because of that, I went home for spring break in early 1980. 
And we lived in a rural part of Oregon, uh, an hour or so away from the nearest city, which was about 15,000 people, not very big. So uh, I drove my mother into the Coos Bay, that city, for a shopping trip and visited the comic store and got the latest edition of The Dragon. And on the way home, my mother, wanting to know what kind of freaky satanic worshiping things I was into, was reading The Dragon. And she noticed a uh, about a sixth column uh, ad, come work for TSR. And she said, you should do this. And I said, no, they'd never take me to work there. So you should do this. So when I went back to school, I put together a, uh, uh, an application, which included about a 10 page dungeon, which I will freely admit was completely garbage. Uh, it was almost done on a random basis with no sensibility for what was where. Dragons in 10 by 10 foot rooms, things like that. But I got a call from Lawrence, Lawrence Schick, well, and, okay. they, and they hired me. And so I was due to go out the weekend of Memorial Day. And for those of you who lived in the Pacific Northwest, uh, the weekend of Memorial Day 1980 is memorable because the winds shifted from Mount St. Helen and covered both SeaTac and Portland with ash and the planes could not take off. So I could not get my plane from Coos Bay to Portland to Milwaukee or to Chicago to Milwaukee. I ended up going to Los Angeles and spending the night in the corridors underneath LAX. No dungeon games, I'm afraid. <laughs> and uh, ended up in Milwaukee a day late and uh, Zeb Cook, David Cook. Uh, oddly, I know two David Cooks in the games business and they both go by Zeb. Really? What's the Zeb? Is that a... Is well, a... Uh, an inside it's, joke what is that <laughs> it's um zeb cook from uh tsr uh, i think it may be his middle name but uh david cook from the computer games business it's his signature he, it, it looks like there's a giant z in it hmm. um but anyway so he picked me up and since i was late he took me straight to the tsr memorial day picnic and softball game which is how I met anyone, but essentially without any sleep. And uh, I went to work Tuesday morning and started in an office with uh, uh, Kevin Hendricks. Mm -hmm. we, were the, we were the development department. He was the development department when I got there. And it was, uh, they didn't even have a chair for me. I had to steal a chair from the conference room down the hall. And I spent the first day reading and thinking about uh, uh, awful green things and we spent a couple of days playing the new version of awful green things uh, which was a great introduction and i was off yeah, i think this is the game you're talking about here right that is the game i'm talking about awful green things from outer space by the great tom wam tom wham who is not only a, was not only a fantastic designer but uh, also a fantastic artist and this. this is a, a sequel. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. This is a sequel to a, a game he put in a magazine called Snit Smashing. Um, and, or metaphorically, at least, it's a sequel, um, which involves small creatures running up inside larger creatures' bodies and trying to kill them. This instead happens in a, a spaceship, but the mechanic is not dissimilar. Um, and it's a very, it's, it's a very interesting game. It's different every time you play it because of the randomness you built in and the random effects of weapons. So you never know what is going to work and what is not going to work against the awful green things. And it was just a whole lot of fun. It was what you think a job in the game company is going to be. You come in, you look at a game, you spend days playing it and making recommendations for it. Uh, that's not what most of the job is, but it was a great introduction. And uh, if I, 
if I suspected the people who hired me of being uh, slightly evil and very clever, I would have said that they'd arranged a demo for me, but uh, they didn't. They, they, they weren't, they aren't, and they didn't. So you mentioned you wrote a, you wrote a dungeon as part of your application for TSR. Was that part of, was, did they ask for that or did you just decide? Yes, they did. Yes, they did. Well, that was sort um, of the proving proof of concept then or. Yeah, well, they wanted to be able to kind see of a portfolio. You, yeah, exactly, exactly. And uh, uh, as I said, it was early. I mean, I've been playing D and D for four yeah, or five years. Asking this already, but how old were you when all this was happening? Oh well, I was. Um, so um, I have to actually count. But I was eighteen when I arrived in oh, wow. uh, Wisconsin. <laughs> like every or maybe no just turned it was late may so i just turned 19. okay Uh, um, and i've been playing DD since i was maybe 14 when i found a copy at our local uh uh, hobby store model store in in eugene oregon where i lived and it was one of the first thousands uh it, it had ants and the other indicators of uh not having been sued by Tolkien's enterprise, Tolkien Enterprises yet. Uh, alas, it, we lived, as I say, we lived in a rural area when I left and uh, the house was not vermin free and the rats got to it, but. Oh no. But it was, that, uh, we were very much- To play with and things, right? Oh yeah, well in, in, in Eugene, yes, we, we had regular games, but it was very primitive by, today's standards. Even, even if you look at people who talk about playing od d now, the concepts of gaming are so much more advanced. For example, dungeons, a lot of them at least, make sense. You don't put large creatures in small rooms and small creatures, maybe you do put small creatures in large rooms, but you don't put giant creatures in rooms that won't hold them. And dungeons have food sources and they have ecologies. We've, we've advanced to the state where it's not just, oh, open the door, let's randomly determine what's behind it. Were you the dungeon least, master for your friends? Um, we, we switched. We, we, in Eugene, we swapped around. Uh, in TS, at TSR, of course, there was a wealth of opportunities, and I ran Top Secret, which is one of the reasons you've got that background behind you. Uh, Lawrence was our primary D&D uh, dungeon master, as I recall, and uh, ran us through an extended uh, uh, Temple of Elemental Evil play test, which was a lot of fun. Oh, that's a great! Did you, did you ever play the computer version of that? I have played it a little in in uh, somewhere along the line. I mostly dropped computer gaming, and I don't. I can't really tell you why. Part of it is that I'm just not very good at it. <laughs> I, I, my reflexes are slow, too slow for shooters. And uh, I have spent a lot of my life living in rural areas where there was not good network. And I lack the patience for open world games in a lot of ways. I have uh, done probably a third of uh, the is it Name of the Wind on, uh, on the uh, Quest system. Um, I think that's the title. It's been a while i've mostly switched to using the quest for vr exercise interesting well i'm i am not sure and what's what's in my head is not uh is not uh sticking so i will have to tell you i don't know and move on (laughs) the joys of being six over 60. everybody watching the video they're probably it's probably already somebody typing in the comments you're thinking about blah 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 I can't believe him. Yeah, okay. Could be. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's see. Where where were we? Uh, you were asking me arriving about uh, about arriving at TSR and we kind oh, of right, right. on uh, yes, what D and D games were like. <laughs> I'm just I'm trying to get my put myself in your shoes. You know, you're like 18, 19, you know, your mom. You know, I guess she didn't think it was too satanic or she wouldn't want you to work with her. Oh, no, no, no. I was joking. My parents were, my mother especially was uh, 
lefty liberal, way left of, of what would be a normal university liberal there, which is what my father was because he taught at the University of Oregon. Uh, she used to joke and say she was a Menshevik, um, which <laughs> if you look it up is pretty far left by our standards. Um, but they also kept an eye on what I did. When I came home with Tom Lehrer, she wanted to listen to it to make sure it wasn't uh, music that would work me in any way. And if you know Tom Lehrer music, you know that it's definitely going to warp me, but not in a bad way. And uh, they don't seem too warped to me. <laughs> it, it was the 60s and, and we were latchkey kids, but they, they tried to make sure we weren't getting into too much trouble. You know, something else I was thinking about too, it's that, you know, I was reading again, some of the other interviews where you talked about this stuff. It said that you really had been playing some war games. I guess you had, I don't know if that included chain mail or not, but, you know, did, did you follow the usual trajectory of you're playing war games and then here comes D and D. So yes. Let's give this, a, let's give this a try. And then something yes. like there. Yes. Uh, a friend of mine introduced me to Avalon Hill games. Oh, wow. Uh, in maybe fourth or fifth grade. And uh, we started with Tactics 2 and, and moved our way up, got into the SPI games, uh, uh, played the, the first of the mega games, War in the East, a bunch of times. And uh, so the, the source in town for those games before a little place called Gandalf's Den opened, which was later, mm. was the... Uh, the local hobby store and uh, they were mostly models and paints and crafts and things like that but they had a space for games so I was in there one day and here was this new thing called well I, there was this new thing called Dungeons and Dragons and there was Chainmail and I got both and I started with Chainmail uh, with figures and um, substitute figures dice and cardboard cutouts and things like that on the dining room table uh, as miniatures battles. And that was fun, um, but it meant leaving a lot of stuff up in a public space in the house for a long time. And my parents weren't terribly good with that. So uh, so d and went with me to junior high and we got a group of people together, including Jeff who got me into the uh, war games and a couple of friends of ours who had were doing that and we were a, a, a click we shared uh, dragons and strategy and tactics and moves and all that stuff that was available on a very slow basis in comparison to today and uh, we started playing D D and we actually we ended up with a sort of a different group uh, Jeff and I were the only war gamers who really transited hard to D&D. But we did, and we played it uh, all through junior high and high school. I moved away from my senior year in high school to that rural area I mentioned, and I started a group there where I dungeon mastered and uh, took it off to college with me. And the first couple of years I was at college, we had a very active group every Friday night and occasionally Saturdays. And uh, once I left Pomona, which was my first college, I went, I went to work for TSR from there. I came back to California to go to UC Santa Cruz. We had an active, uh, we had active games there and we did some champions as well. Yeah. And, uh, but once school ended, everybody I played with got jobs. And gaming became harder. For a while, we stuck with it over in, in the Valley, in Santa Clara and, and Palo Alto and places like that. Did a lot of weird games. Uh, Rollmaster in its early days. And uh, uh, the occasional Bunnies and Burrows or Monsters, Inc. Or there was a fencing game whose name I, whose name I can't remember. Bushido. We were, we were eclectic and D&D &D kind of fell away out of that. And uh, yeah, I did. Uh, so all my friends got real jobs and I started making computer games. <laughs> oh, I forgot, Rune, Rune Maker, Rune Master. 
um, there was a, it's still alive. There was an online version of it. One of my kids played with Robert Leyland, who's in Toys Quest. for Bob with Paul Ritchie. RuneQuest. There you oh, go. Master Hungus or is it, or is it RuneQuest? It was RuneQuest. It was RuneQuest. Robert Leyland ran that. He, uh, at the time he worked for Island Graphics. Now he works for Toys for Bob with Paul Ritchie. And uh, yeah. So you're really exploring all of these other sort of alternatives. Well, it was uh, not unlike the early days of computer games. There was a lot of stuff. Um, and yeah, D&D was probably the 100 pound gorilla, but all of this other stuff had shelf space along with it. I, I'm going to switch for a minute. One of the things that the people at TSR never did took a long time to realize is that <clears throat> selling the game wasn't a sustainable business model. Because in the early game, you bought the game, you bought some dice, and that was it. Because you built everything else. So they started working on modules. But modules were they were an improvement because they could go on forever. But in terms of the amount of work that went into them and the amount you could sell them for and how often someone would buy one, they still weren't a great sustainable model. So they were still struggling to figure out how to make this a sustainable business without having to constantly expand their customer pool, which is a great thing to do for a while, but eventually you run out of cust potential customers. And as a consequence, they were not filling the shelf footage that they do now. I walk into a, a, a hobby store or a game store now, and I look at the shelves of D&D stuff and Pathfinder stuff, and it's just ungodly. It goes on forever. But we weren't there yet. So all that shelf space was filled up with alternate games. Yeah, I remember you, <clears throat> some of these interviews you talked about, and this kind of surprised me. I guess I don't know a whole lot about TSR at the time, but they were trying to expand into, well, I think it was a Candyland style. That was what Paul and I talked about. It. Yeah, and this, is, oh, this was game. part of their... It's just kind of hard to imagine this company trying to pursue that. Well... Style. They're just trying to get we, we, themselves, I guess. Yes, and again, they're trying to find a sustainable business model. Uh, children's games, young children's games, are a cool sustainable business model because there is a never ending supply of new young children. Well, well there's that. <laughs> <laughs> um, whereas adults can buy a game once and assuming they're careful with it, play it for another 40 years. You get a new crop of seven year olds every year and kids are not good at taking care of their stuff. <laughs> so that was a very sensible theoretical business model for them. From our point of view, I will speak only for myself, but uh, uh, Paul exited in similar time frame. That was not the kind of game I wanted to work on. And as I believe I have noted somewhere in some of those interviews, I was an angry young man. And upper management and I did not get along entirely. I did not like the way that uh, upper management, co TSR collectively treated David Arneson and uh, other things, which none of which were probably really a good enough reason to be as angry as I was. So it's, and, and people make up stories about why other people do things. So at the time I was absolutely convinced and I think I convinced Paul as well that the official change to Candyland games was designed to get rid of me or possibly us. That's pretty uh, arrogant to think that they would go to all that trouble when they could just say, you're fired. Um, <laughs> and again, I now know after taking an MBA and doing a really interesting weekend uh, simulation that yeah, people will make up stories if you don't give them the real story. So I made up this story. I don't 
think I now think it was probably not true. They were looking for a sustainable business model. They may have been a little desperate. Um, so the idea that they wanted to move into a wholly different market actually now as an adult with a little business experience behind me makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. And it would have been a tol tolerable job if I hadn't been quite such an angry young man. Angry young man. I, I know this. I, <laughs> I know, I know <laughs> it's like. <laughs> it's the stage a lot of us go through. Oh, sure. You know, I was just thinking of the, you know, your time there at TSR and going from being like, this is so cool and this is so exciting and, you know, all this stuff that, to, to end up disillusioned. And also, I think it might come as a shock to some people anyway, especially younger viewers, that there was this period where we don't, you know, <laughs> I'm trying to imagine, like, you're not making money with Dungeons and Dragons. You know, it's this huge, you know, unbelievably big thing. But, you know, it sounds like there was a spot there where, yeah, we don't know if we're going to keep the lights on with this. I mean, I'm. I'm not privy to the financials of TSR at that time. I was privy to the sense of the building, if you will, and the fact that not too terribly long after that, although I don't know the exact timeline anymore, there were discussions of mergers and buyouts and licensings and just all kinds of things kind of going on. And one of the things to remember is that Gary was a small businessman. If I recall correctly, I believe a cobbler. And the Blooms were in some sort of kind of semi-industrial business. I don't, again, I don't know exactly what. Uh, we referred to them ironically inside the building as coming from heavy industry, which I don't think was entirely accurate. But none of these people were trained in business the way somebody starting a business like that now would be. Mm -hmm. Nobody had an MBA. Uh, I, I don't know, there, there was nobody with uh, official degrees in marketing or production or, or anything. I think everybody was pretty much learning as they went. And the bigger something gets, as long as something is growing fast, money isn't a problem. But when it plateaus, all of a sudden money becomes a problem because you haven't been worrying about it and you've just been kind of running as fast as you can to keep up and, and making things work. And so I'm complicated by a founder's crisis in the sense that Gary and Dave were not both running TSR. Um, the, the blooms, I think, Brian was officially the highest of, uh, position among the Blooms, but uh, um, he was not a games guy. So you had this kind of, uh, technically a founder's crisis is when the founder of the company gets overwhelmed. In this case, you kind of had multiple founders and it was hard to tell whose vision was in charge and who had the operational chops to keep the company going and like that. And mm -hmm. it, was, it, it was a robust enough market and a robust enough product that that didn't kill them. But it certainly didn't make them the most efficient company in the world and the most well-run company in the world and the most carefully thought out company in the world. The more I hear about it, the more I think about how something similar sort of happened at, at Atari, you know, with Nolan Bushnell and Al Alcorn. And yeah. Suddenly they, you know, I think he's an engineer. He has to be a lot of engineers and like, <laughs> this thing is so successful, <clears throat> but not having that business acumen, you know, the, it just kind of went, got out of control. It's yeah. almost like you're victim the of only success, you know, is, is the way I've heard that described sometimes. Yeah, the only the only company I know that's really honestly run was really honestly run by an engineer was Adobe, where John Warnock. I, I was at Adobe in uh, the early two thousands, and um, John Warnock, the company's twenty years old. John Warnock, the president, is still getting was still getting technical patents. 
at the time. Now he had a partner, get Chuck Geschke, who was a business genius and they knew how to select good people. So it's really hard for an engineer to really run a company. And I, I think it's almost that hard. It's gotta be almost that hard for a designer to. Paul Ritchie is an, I think is an exception, but he has also um, run his, uh, uh, run his company. He didn't, he didn't start trying to run the company. He had a lot of experience in the games business and in Silicon Valley, seeing other people run companies before he took the reins and you know, ran it all himself. Yeah, he's done all right, I think it's safe to say. <laughs> uh, let's get into a little bit. Well, let me ask a couple of quick questions before we jump into Top Secret. I'm kind of curious if you were, had worked uh, with George McDonald. Are you familiar with Oh, him? yeah. Yeah, I know I, George. I thought about you talking about Shannon Hands, and I know that's his. Well, no, I, I know all the heroes because <laughs> later on, uh, while independent, we worked for a year, two years on a Champions computer game. Uh, Ray Greer, who is one of the original three, actually lived in my house for several mm -hmm. years and eventually married my ex-wife after we broke up and they are still together. Uh, so yeah, I know uh, Ray, Steve, and George. Uh, Bruce, not quite as well, but Bruce is kind of, he, he's kind of the sidekick. He came on, along a little bit later. And I also worked with George uh, later when I was just doing independent programming and he was a producer for somebody I was working with. I honestly don't remember who right now. Who else was I going to ask? Oh, I was just out of, out of curiosity. I wondered if you know uh, Dave Wesley. Uh, name yeah. is <clears throat> familiar, but I'm having trouble sorting it out. I you know, I interviewed him a pretty well. He lives pretty close to me here in Minnesota, uh, but I just, you know, he talked a lot about the origins of D&D &D and how some of the folks that were kind of instrumental in the, the innovations that led to it don't get mentioned very often. <laughs> I just remember he was, uh, I'll make a note just, of that. Just Googling him, just Googling him. Uh, yeah, that's very true. And they're... Um... He was talking about six or seven. I think he was... If I remember correctly, was doing something like Brownstein. Um, yeah, I think I am thinking of someone else. Uh, but anyway, a, we can Dave, a Dave W name at, at Adobe. But yes, but it's absolutely true that the, well, I discovered relatively recently reading online that a lot of the people who were in important positions at TSR, like the guy who was basically running the manufacturing were people who had done significant things in the development of the role-playing genre. They had substantial games or they had interesting places they'd created. Uh, I want to say uh, Mike Carr, for instance. Um, and, uh, and I read a book about Dave Arneson's unique view I, again i cannot remember the name of it but i can look it up uh, i have it on my i'm pretty sure i have the book itself on my tablet here um and so i have i've read a little bit of of history relatively recently and uh um yeah there were a lot of people who yeah uh who contributed and did not. Yeah, Carr, he fight in the skies. We played a lot of fight in the skies when I was at uh, uh, TSR. Um, and yeah, there are a lot of people who get kind of wrapped up and, and included in Gary Gygax. Mm -hmm. And there is no question that Gary Gygax was perhaps the most important figure in the development of TSR as time went on, certainly, development and, and uh, production and popularization. But we can't forget Dave Arneson. We can't forget Mike Carr. We can't forget these other people, uh, Kim Mohan. Uh, we cannot forget these people. And even though I'm forgetting them right now, but remember, <laughs> it's been 40 years since I was in this business. Yeah, I want to say there there's were, like a three-volume history book out about all of this. 
three or four, yes. And I think it may have been some one of that, one of those that I was perusing at a game store. Uh, but there's also a specific book self-published by one of the early people about Dave Arneson. Uh, and it sounds almost like there were sort of factions there at TSR with well, there were eventually like an Arneson faction. Is that is that special? Yeah, yeah. Well, there were there were factions everywhere. Nice. Um, and at, at TSR, there were at least a couple of us who felt that Dave Arneson was being treated poorly by the board. Whether we were a faction or not, or just people who admired his work and thought he deserved to be extremely well compensated for it, uh, I can't tell you. Them or what, what, what's the... Uh, again, the details, the details are, are fuzzy, but the rumor, at least, was that there were uh, stock manipulations happening to deprive him of value. Whether that's a true, whether that's true, a uh, confusion about something that actually did happen or completely made up, I can't tell you. Again, it's been 40 years. Um, there was something going on. Yeah, but that was, uh, uh, yeah, uh, I, in looking things up on my screen, Tom Moldvay pops up. Uh, yeah, there's another, there's another name. I've already mentioned Lawrence. In the way of artists, people like Errol Otis. Errol and Paul did some great uh, independent supplements for role-playing games before they joined TSR. Uh, the Daves. Uh, there were there were many Dave artists named Dave at TSR. Uh, there was uh, Dave Sutherland. There was uh, well, there was DSL and D three, and uh, at least one more. <laughs> um, uh, Rosloff. Um, uh, in the the field of people, I'm trying to think of everybody on our floor above the dungeon hobby shop in the hotel. Uh, Lawrence and Tom and Paul in design, Harold, Harold Johnson in editing, Steve Sullivan, who has gone on to do some really great monster movie uh, and kaiju stuff. Um, uh, Mike Price, who uh, I think retired to Arizona and is a, a really fine art photographer these days. He and he and Harold, somebody else, uh, were were production as we called them, which is to say that they they mostly handled the workflow on actual uh, layouts and stuff. Who else? You know, often think about the value of the, that those artists. I mean, we tend to fixate on like the writers and the people that come up with the gameplay mechanics, but really, where would it be without that fantastic artwork? Um, I, on a philosophical level, I agree. I look at a lot of the art that was produced back then, and I cringe. Oh. <laughs> yeah, we let's get it. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to jump over uh, this, this this thing you sent me about the princess. Oh, oh God! Jump onto that because it has some artwork. I think it's is it Errol? His artwork in this. Errol has artwork in the original B three. Yes. Um, as B3, does Alice uh, of the Silver Princess. Yeah. Uh, again, I questionable, I want to know, questionable, <laughs> questionable artwork. <laughs> this is again, not. Again, I. Is it going to? Yeah, I, I want to po point out. I want to point out that I was the angry young man. Um, and again, the decapus uh, is. Uh, it, I think it was more the language, as I note in that conversation and interview. Um, yeah, I got a little bit. A little bit racy, I think. No, is that well? Not really, it but it, it was. It was the. It was the seventies. <laughs> well, um, quote about it. I have to see if I could. Yeah, but no, I, 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 I mentioned that. that it didn't seem like anything to me that would have raised hackles. Well, again, like, you're talking about. Yeah, here it is. Business people. Yeah, a beautiful young um, woman. 
hangs from the ceiling. Nine ugly men can be seen poking their swords lightly into her flesh, all the while taunting her in an unknown language and pulling at what few clothes she has on. Maybe it's that last part. <laughs> well, pulling at what few also, re also remember the original cover to the dungeon board game. The, the original cover to the dungeon board game, the players uh, envisioned are about eight. So there was not a firm sense that D&D &D was a game for adults yet. And if they were thinking about wanting, if they wanted to market D&D &D to kids, that language is one thing. If they're marketing D&D &D to adults, that language uh -huh. is a whole other thing. That's and I'm not sure there was a clear picture of that at the time. Um, I, I can't. That makes, that makes sense, you know, if you're worried about your, you know, six or um, You got to be, how old? <clears throat> I guess there were people, kids that young playing D&D. &D. Were there? Well, I don't know about D&D, &D, but I'm talking about the dungeon board oh, game. Oh, the dungeon board game. Now, let me <clears throat> see if I can find but, but I, So I'm just, I'm just splitting to those extremes because where do you draw the line? Is that language okay for a 12-year-old, a 14-year-old? I, I, when you talk about an adult, I think there's no problem at all. And uh, they were also, they've been through the Egbert thing and they were stressed about that. Yeah, James Dallas Egbert. Uh, and although it turned out that no publicity is bad publicity in that particular case, they were still concerned about their image. And so that may have had something to do with it. And, and let's be honest, I'm pretty sure there was a significant element of misogyny in the whole process of working on B3. And since that includes, I, 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 I hate to say that, not only because I'm, I was part of it, um, but yeah, uh, I, I'm pretty sure that was the case. Jean was the only woman in the design group. Mm -hmm. um, she was uh, known to be close to people in management and therefore was viewed with some suspicion. Um, so I think that, yeah, this one, this yes, one, I'm trying I, to I figure was, out what's questionable about this. I was told that, and I think it's in the text there, I was told that someone thought that that looked like a hand on a penis, not a hand holding a piece of meat <laughs> to give to an animal. Don't, don't see it. <laughs> I, I, I don't think I see it either, even, even now. But, and, um, and I would certainly never suspect Jim Rosloff uh, of, of doing that. I might suspect Errol of slipping something like that in. If you go back to the uh, uh, the picture of the Ubus, uh, questionable artwork number two, uh, which is by Errol, I'm pretty sure. And you look at the it is, you pictures the, on the wall. Yeah, yeah. So if you if you open that up and you look at the pictures on the wall, the two pictures in the center have a very definite political meaning. The bottom one is just over the, the ubu's shoulder. Uh, the figure partially obscured by the ubu is me, <laughs> wearing beret and mirrored sunglasses. And the one on the right is Paul, and the one in the middle is Errol. Uh, as we dressed up to go over to the management building, which was separate from where the developers were, for me to resign. Mm. And if you look at the uh, uh, one above, uh, there's a moose in there. The moose is the incarnation of uh, the moose god Mali, also known as the god of fun. And I believe the figures are Paul and Errol who developed or, or, or uncovered the concept of Mali long before they came to TSR and spread it while they were there. Um, so yeah, and, oh yeah, and uh, Chaz, the, the rounded portrait on the right, that's Chaz. Uh, Jeff D, who was, Jeff was really young compared to the rest of us, at least a couple of years younger. And at, at that age, we all feel those years a lot. Um, and he was, 
geeky and inoffensive and and just a pleasant little young guy but he had this alter ego who wore shades and and a, a black leather jacket and uh if if he could have stood it you know, probably would have would have had a cigarette dangling from his his mouth all the time and uh yeah jazz jazz was trouble and so errol put those things in very deliberately as part of the uh I, i'm really not happy with tsr at this moment uh Definitely. vibe that he and, man he and paul and i had are going yes um or at least i i believe that's how that happened <laughs> Um, it, it might be better to get uh, confirmation from Errol, I suppose. Well, that's so cool. All, but, the, all the little Easter eggs in these drawings. I mean, I would have had no idea. Well, and and actually, now that I'm looking at that picture, I believe the three heads on the largest Ubu are Gygaxes. Um, I, I'm not sure about I'm not sure about every head there. Obviously, some of them are no one in particular, but some of them look to me like they might have been someone. Um, so anyway. But... Yeah, so this was, and then there's one more, I think that, again, I don't know what the- uh, The last one, I don't think I have any the idea. Of the dragon. And this was yeah i don't think i don't have any idea about that yeah that was just strange now on the plus side i think that paul i came back to i left in may almost a, almost a year to the day after i joined um i came back to uh gen con that year and Paul negotiated a deal with somebody. Very few of us ended up with copies of B3 before they were collected and destroyed, allegedly destroyed. I don't have any direct knowledge of that. But the copies were put on everybody's desk whenever a new module came out. And the, there may have some of us who left the office between the time they were put on our desk and the time someone came around to collect them for alleged destruction actually got away with real copies. Uh, Paul had one, I had one. There is a rumor and uh, that another member of the design development production staff had a contact in the management building in the print shop who saved not only the uh, galleys, but also a crate of, of modules, allegedly. I don't know how, how true any of that is, but allegedly, I know that Paul sold his at Gen Con that year for multiple hundreds of dollars, and I sold mine many years later for about twelve hundred dollars. Wow! It financed my it financed my first digital uh, SLR camera, and I believe I recall seeing that one sold through Frank Menser uh, three to ten years ago for something in the something over five figures. Mm -hmm. Wow, so we would need to find that crate. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's probably a lot less valuable since Wizards to the Coast released the PDF version. Well, still, I don't know. But 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 having the, the original thing yeah, the original thing would be important. Yeah. yeah. Well, speaking um, of espionage and secrets. Let's talk a little bit about this game. Okay. Operation yeah, Top Seven Secret. Seal. Yeah, this is us reading. A, I haven't played Top Secret, but I was reading about some of the innovations here. I think there's an article on Wikipedia I was reading, and it was pointing out how it was based on a D10 system and a few other things that were seemed pretty innovative. Top Secret. Yeah, yeah. Top Secret was a fun, different game. Um, I think it came out while it came out out either just before or while i was at tsr and i ran uh, a, a top secret game most for most of the time i was there for paul ritchie and lawrence schick and errol and the occasional other person 
Paul Arrow and Lawrence were the Mohawks. They all had Mohawk haircuts dyed different colors. They were <laughs> incredibly um, uh, straightforward and, and, and destructive. I particularly recall a moment they were driving across the Australian outback in uh, open Jeeps or the equivalent. And at some point, because I knew there were traps ahead of them, I asked, how fast are you driving? And there was a short discussion. And finally, Paul turned to me and said, five miles an hour faster than is safe. <laughs> Which I think sums up their philosophy perfectly. And in fact, included Paul, uh, included the that the vehicle Paul was standing up in, hitting a punji trap and getting him completely impaled and him trying incredibly hard to convince me that his fame could somewhere, there was a, a, a mechanism in top secret of fame points, which could be accumulated and luck points, which could not. And they could basically get you out of a problem if you could come up with a way that being lucky or famous would do it. And Paul was busily trying to convince me that a steak would not stick him because he was famous. And, and that did not fly because I think he was either didn't have his luck point for the game or was trying to save it for something. Um, but it was a fun game and it worked pretty well. Uh, Merle, Merle wrote a, a good system. As far as I know, it did not need to be uh, uh, beaten up a lot once we got hold of it, which was not the case for most submissions. I did bluebirds for most of the year I was there and what some people thought made a game or a module was truly incredible. Um, I got, I got a, a two page, well, one college ruled page in crayon on both sides. And I wanna emphasize this was not from a young person. This was from somebody who was <laughs> what? in their 20s. A crayon. And, and so that was a, this was a module, they thought. <laughs> And the whole year I was there, I think I remember two things that were worth publishing. And one of them turned into Roaring Twenties, although it took a lot of work, but the concept was good. And one of them was, I think, a Gamma World module from James Ward, which you would kind of expect would uh, be good because he had done this professionally before, had just written this on spec. But, uh, hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of pieces of complete and utter crap, far worse than the thing I had sent in, which was, by this point, I knew was pretty bad. I have the PDF here. A little wind, though. <clears throat> Probably not strictly legal here. But we Operation can... Seventh Seal. Well, I'm, yeah. I'm not going to stress about it. Um, yeah, and this is almost exactly as I wrote it. I believe we cha they changed the main characters the the plain the main villain's name because i had made a rude pun that was both uh 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 crude and somewhat racist um but it was a, it was an interesting thing to do it's based on an article that came out in the 70s in psychology today i believe which largely detailed the necessary uh steps to build a crude fission bomb and made it clear that it's well within the capacity of anybody who has material and is willing to die uh, shortly after they finish it because the stuff you're dealing with is really poisonous and radioactive and unpleasant. And then I just wrapped a, I, I wrapped a, a sort of a, a cover of tarot cards around it to give it a theme and a, a graphical look yeah there we go there's um, some yes alistair crowley uh well well known as a as an evil magician and around the turn of the last century that would be the 19 the 1800s 1900s not uh the more recent one um but also a really interesting person in the social sense uh he was he uh um, in, in a way, he wasn't he wasn't successful in the same way, but he was kind of outrageous in the same way that 
Donald Trump and boy George have been just sort of fighting against uh, a lot of the conventional norms of society. And uh, yeah. The spring back. Those are all, the, yeah, those are all. Well, so for instance, I'm, I'm going to get names wrong, but your upper left, that's one of the day of artists, I'm pretty sure. Um, the second row is Zeb Cook and his wife, Helen, who just moved out to near me in Seattle, but I have not seen them yet. Uh, they're actually down toward Tacoma. Um, uh, I want to say that might be be Ro J Jim Rosloff, but I'm not sure. Uh, again, it's been a very long time, but yes, those are those are all people I worked with. That's fun. What if, you know, it's a fun way to put, you know, some. Well, it's cheap. It's a way to do it cheap, which was always important because a module, the, the rule of thumb that I was given for a module is that a module has to sell at the time for about five bucks. And it's got to sell for 10 times its production cost. So you've got to be able to, to print whatever it is for under 50 cents. And then on top of that, you've got to keep the actual cost of creating it down as far as you can, because that's a, that's a fixed cost, not a, uh, not a, not a uh, marginal or per unit cost. So anything they could do to reduce the production costs was a good thing and not having to get models in for a shoot would absolutely be a win for them. And of course it was a lot harder then without digital cameras, but you've got to do it with, with real film and real developing and real printing. Oh, and... I didn't even think about that. <laughs> that just looks yeah, like it's a lot good. of work that goes into these things. I mean, this is just a lot of text alone. I wrote, I, I, I wrote, Let's see, I wrote that on an Atari 800. I don't remember the name of the word processor, but one of those old screen, 24 characters wide, um, something like you'd see in war games. <laughs> and I wrote it in the summer. Typing the final clean copy took me two weeks. And I had a word processor. That's a hundred odd, hundred odd typed pages, 115 typed pages, maybe. Um, the concept came quickly and filling out the details took probably no more than a, a, a week or two. And then the typing, I would guess I finished it in four to six weeks, but it might've been three months. And I did it for a one-time payment of, you know, I don't remember how much it was. It was in the single digits of thousands of dollars. I can tell you that. Um, it might have been fifteen hundred. It might have been three. I'm trying but, to think. Uh, I don't know. And I <laughs> must have been. I mean, it was a decent. Was that a decent amount of money, or was it like, oh no? Oh, I thought. I thought it was. I thought it was good money, and uh, uh, I was. I was happy that there was some negotiation involved, and I think uh, Brian Bloom pulled the. Well, we're only doing this because we like you or we feel like we owe you something from the way you left or something like that. But uh, no, it, I did not feel like I was underpaid. In fact, I think at the time, I thought I was getting pretty well paid for the amount of work that had actually gone into it. And that was the summer before I re-entered college at UC Santa Cruz. And when I left Pomona, private college, a semester was five or $6,000. And when I entered UC public college, I believe a semester was $1,200. So whatever that was, it paid for at least a semester of school and maybe the whole year. That's awesome. <laughs> I guess you get, it must have gone over pretty well. Do you get good reviews or was that a... It, uh, since I didn't get royalties, honestly, I didn't pay a lot of attention. I think it, it, was, it was a relatively rare thing there weren't a lot of top secret modules and that may be the only one that wasn't done by Merle. In fact, I had to fight a, an online site at some point to, to get them to change the credit on this from Merle to me uh, until I pointed out to them, look at the cover. Just, <laughs> just look at the cover <laughs> you've got on your screen. I understand that the type is in yellow and it's kind of against the background. It's hard to read, but my name is there. <laughs> um, 
so honestly, I have no idea how well it did. And I have no idea how well it did in relationship to other things. But I don't think there were more than a dozen top secret modules ever made mm -hmm. for the original game. So it obviously was not a big success for them. Yeah, I've been waiting for a really good espionage computer role-playing game. And there's been some efforts over the years, but I don't think that anybody's quite nailed it. You know, it's like alpha protocols, one that comes to mind, but I don't know if you're familiar with any. I'm I'm completely unfamiliar with it. My my limit would be going into sneaking games like uh uh Google 13 Hitman. There we go. That's how it ended up translated to the, the street Hitman. Um where your your job is basically to be not seen and to kill anybody who sees you. And and that's an interesting mechanism, but it's not all there should be to a, a spy. I mean, look at your basic James Bond movie. Mm -hmm. And and all of the so you I, I, yes, you've got shooting and blowing things up, you've got driving, you've got sneaking, but you've also got uh seduction and uh uh uh, social engineering people into letting you into the place you're not supposed to be and getting the pictures and, and uh, lock picking and hacking. There are so many things that doing it justice on a computer, I think, remains not impossible, but difficult. You got to pick your battles. I was looking at a description of a game called uh, Red Matter 2, uh, which is a VR product on the Quest. And it... Uh, um, it's sort of that kind of game, although I suspect it will weigh toward the shooter. And But they talk about having to, to solve puzzles on screen, which is kind of the, the limit, I think, at this point of our ability to do real hacking and real social engineering and, and stuff like that. Because honestly, and, and partially rightfully so, because... Who wants to not be able to solve a game because they don't know how to pick a lock in the real world? Or they can't figure out how to break a password in the real world. Mm -hmm. The whole point of a game is to let you do things that you can't do in real life and enjoy them and experience them in a safe way and hopefully not a terribly frustrating way because otherwise you don't come back to the game. So some sort of... of uh, accommodation, simplification, transference to a different model has to happen here. And picking out the right way to do it is why there are good designers and not so good designers and really bad designers like me. Um, I know what has to be done, but I don't know what makes it good. Paul knows what makes it good. Paul can take a really stupid, Paul can take a really stupid idea of mine and make it absolutely work. And that's, that is the magic. Oh, you're ready to transition into the world of your computer games? If you like. Yeah. I'm not sure what's the first one that just going by Moby well, games that list world tour golf. Oh God, no, that's that's not the first. That's that's not even the second. Mm -hmm. Um, so the first one did not get published. Oh, so it's not even gonna be on here then. Well, the, the it was a port. If you if you run up to your your search screen and Google and, and check Moby Games for Picnic Paranoia, um, I got a con picnic like going out to the to the to the park to eat. Picnic Paranoia. Um, it was a game on. I think it was on the Apple. Okay. It was on the. Apple or the Atari, and I got a job. I got a contract to port it to the Commodore sixty four. Um, Is that which I did? That's the game. Um, well, but the they never. Oh, I see. Yeah, but but they never published the Commodore sixty four version. But that's how I got my start, and that's how my wife, who was a, a biochem major, started to learn to program because she was doing the art for me doing the conversion art. It's really hard to tell, but those black things are, are ants. And they are moving. And if you get enough ants on a piece of food, they'll push it off the screen and you have to run around and swat them. Um, <laughs> occasionally you, you get a bug spray and then there are spiders. 
Uh, and, and my wife was doing the art for the spiders and she really wanted to see them work and I wasn't ready to put them in. So she picked up a book about 6502 programming and started the next day. Uh, oh, and she wow. is still in the computer game business. But so that's how I, that's how I started. Awesome. I got paid. I got paid for doing it, even though it did not get published. And again, that was in the maybe $3,000 to range for probably four to six months of work. Um, I lived in a, we lived in a really crappy uh, apartment building, about 12 apartments in uh, the Northeast Bay area, a place called San Pedro, which is virtual Richmond with a hooker downstairs from us. Um, and uh, yeah, we were fresh out of school and, and we were living the life. And so from there, uh, we got together with Paul and proposed a bunch of games, a bu many of which were really bad and some of which were outright uh, offensive and sent, a, sent them into this new company called Electronic Arts. And Paul knew some of the artists who are already working for Electronic Arts, Freefall, uh, John Freeman and Ann Westfall, who he had worked with at Epix Automated Simulations. And uh, they liked the idea for Mail Order Monsters. Uh, and we spent a year or so doing that. Uh, I was, again, technically lead. I had a degree, very rare in the business, but that gave me some, uh, uh, some respectability in the eyes of people who didn't know me. So I was technically the lead. Nikki was technically the, the assistant, but we were really co-programmers and the game split very nicely into a, we are creating monsters and we are fighting monsters. So I did the fighting monsters, she did the creating monsters and uh, uh, that worked out really well. And Mail Order Monsters was a, a mild hit, uh, 50,000 at least. Uh, oh, I remember yeah. an e I love the heck out of this game. I played it on the Commodore 64. Well, thank you. Um, and uh, uh, I later had a uh, uh, engineer candidate at Adobe yeah, when I asked you. him, yeah, Evan Robinson, Nikki Robinson. Um, when I asked, uh, I asked this candidate, so what got you into programming? And he said, when I was a kid, I had this game called Mail Order Monsters. And I just looked at him and said, you looked me up, didn't you? And he said, no, what are you talking about? I said, I made that game. <laughs> I still have the music for the, the, the victory screen on my uh, desktop at home. Um, yeah, this was, it was, we took way too long to build it. One of the, the quirks of my being in the, computer in the game business was that I wanted to do something completely new every time. Not a great business model, but that was how I wanted to do things. And Paul tolerated it. <laughs> I don't know what Nikki's opinion of it was. So we spent a long time doing every game, pretty much a year, uh, developing everything from graphics on up. And uh, um, yeah, this was developed completely in assembly. Okay. We had a we had a, a system uh, that let us edit and save and compile on Atari 800s, and then transfer via a homemade cable through the uh, the game ports to the Commodore, where it would run and we could test it. Uh, very primitive, but worked. Um, somewhere I have a, a printout of the source code for Miller to Monsters, and it's uh, it's about three reams of paper. It's really horrifying how uh, not dense assembly code is. And uh, yeah, Miller to Monsters was in the it was relatively early in EA's life, not the first generation of games or even the second, but they were still really serious about the marketing and the, the okay. presentation of the product. So the packaging was done by a big name ad agency in uh, San Francisco. This photo, this is taken in front of the post office 
uh, in downtown San Francisco. We did a multi-hour shoot there. Um, and yeah, they were, they were just very serious about it. If you look at the front cover of the game, it, it, they got a mock-up, they got a, a, a kaiju kind of thing coming through. And, and this was all done, this was all a physical object. None of this was done in Photoshop. Mm-hmm. This is all a physical object with someone blowing smoke through the back of it. Um, and yeah, it was... Well, it really bobs on the shelf, you know. Uh, it, oh, it, even it, like the little EA, Yeah. And EA was very clever to build packaging that occupied more shelf space. Except for the fact that sometimes it got turned sideways and it had essentially no spine. So as long as people had it on the display the way EA wanted it to be, it showed really well. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, the order monsters. It, it got our foot in the door. Uh, we had held out. It, it began a series of what the hell are we going to call this thing officially? Uh, that ran through I think every game I ever did. Uh, we began with. Uh, uh, it wasn't monster. It might have been Monster Island. Teratomorse was in there somewhere. They kept telling us that uh, the, that we couldn't we couldn't use those names. And eventually, they came up with Mail Order Monsters, which wasn't bad. The story on golf is much worse, and I'll tell it when we get there, because uh, <laughs> because that's next. Um, and the genesis of golf was so Electronic Arts was still in their original building on the top of the hill in San Mateo, um, Campus Drive. And one day we came in and everybody in the place was absolutely wild over this new machine they'd got from Nintendo with a golf game in it. Mm. And Trip and a number of the executives were pretty serious golfers and they wanted a version, only they wanted a golf construction set mm. as they had done the, the uh, pinball construction set. And certainly they were working at the time on racing construction set and uh, music construction set well, those are may have come good. later, but anyway, so, so golf construction set. So we need to, like you did, like you guys did this in Miller Monsters, we figured it'll be pretty easy here. We need a golf game and we need a course builder. And so we split up again, uh, rather the same way. Nikki mostly did the course builder. I did some of the work. Um, and uh, I mostly did the golf game. Um, and we all went out and took golf lessons and kind of learned how to play. Oh, you didn't know how and to play golf? Here. <laughs> no, no, we did not know how to play wow. golf when we started this game. So we, we had the, the unusual ability to take golf lessons for a year and, uh, and claim them as a deduction on our taxes. Nice. <laughs> and in fact, Honestly, Electronic Arts still owes me. They promised us 18 holes at Pebble Beach, and we never got that. Um, anyway, so uh, we can get trip on uh, the line. Yeah, I, I, I think I'm okay. Uh, besides <laughs> which, it would take me days to uh, uh, to to make an 18 hole uh, course on uh, yeah, construct. Yeah, so. Um, There are some interesting things about this. This was originally developed on the IBM PC. It was one of the first generation of games developed by Electronic Arts for the PC. And so I had to develop bitmap graphics because we weren't familiar with bitmap graphics because all the graphics on the Atari and the Commodore 64 are are cell-based, they're font-based essentially. So you have have, uh, tiles instead of pixels. So Electronic Arts lent me a guy named Dan Silva, who had developed an editor at Xerox Park and had graphics routines to draw lines and shapes and all that stuff. And he gave me the code and I wrestled with it until it worked on the IBM PC. Uh, And the... Yeah, the PC did not, yeah, you look at, for instance, every screen here tells you what kind of screen it is. So you've got Tandy, which had one kind of graphics. You have EGA, which is one kind of graphics. You have CGA, which is a different kind of graphics. You have 
Hercules monochrome, which is a different kind of graphics. So we had to handle all of these different things, which was entertaining and difficult. <laughs> but we got it done. And those graphics routines served us well later. And in fact, were used in Starflight 2 and possibly other EA products. We got uh, we got $10,000 for getting into EA. Uh, nice. And... Um, we worked this through. We shamelessly, we went to courses and we shamelessly got their scorecards and we copied them. I'm sure that would not be allowed today. Um, we did the, uh, the PC version, or the original. I did a port to the Commodore 64, which had its entertaining points. I think uh, EA, probably Brent Iverson, did the Apple II GS port and Somebody got uh, all of these look good for the time. Yes, thank you. Uh, and uh, and Nikki, no, Nick, no, and, and EA hired someone to do the Amiga port. I think. Um, yeah, this is the one I played. And, and make- we did, yeah, and we, we did some fun things. There are there are some made up courses that are just kind of weird and fun and the holes look like things. Um, I was never entirely happy with the golf ball flight model because it's not really a flight model. It's, uh, it's just some uh, geometric equations that look like a golf ball. But it was fun, we enjoyed it. We, uh, learning a new machine was a, a benefit for me. Paul developed, if not the first, a very early version of a round swing meter for for this game, which was unusual and has turned out to be the right interface for this game. Um, At the time, there's a friend of a friend's had, I think, Ben Hogan golf, and he used a, a, a flat meter does not work quite as well. Um, and there have been a lot of a lot of variants. But in my opinion, Paul came really close to the right, because everybody knows what a golf swing looks like. It's a circle. You go, you go back, you go forward. Um, and, and that interface has stood the test of time in a lot of other implementations. Is there any, oh, the name. So it, during development, this was either uh, the golf construction set or um, Master Tour Golf, MTG. And uh, everyone acknowledged that the name, neither of those names is going to be the real name, but you've got to have a name to, to talk about the product before you name the product. And we were getting close. In fact, we had gotten to the point where I told our, oh, I need to step back. Finishing mail order monsters was a nightmare. Uh, I have a t-shirt somewhere that says I went through 32 betas or something like that. And every beta is one that's supposed to be finished. <laughs> and it took it took forever. And Mark Lewis, who was a, a game tester at EA at the time and later I think ran worldwide distribution, he, he, he went all the way. Um, uh, anyway, uh, went through every one of them, found something wrong, we fixed it, and eventually we made t-shirts because it took so long. It took, it took about three months. So we were concerned when we got toward the end of golf and said, guys, the last thing we have to do is the title screen. We can't do the title screen until you settle on a name. And everybody's like, yeah, but you're going to go through 20 betas, so it doesn't matter. But it's like, no, we we are going to get to the point soon where we will stop work if you don't give us a name. So there were meetings, some with us, some without us. At one meeting, I was told that seriously tabled for consideration here was big pink balls with dimples (laughs) with a cover screen of a red golf ball and and a driver next to it. Hmm. Um, I don't know uh, what, what all names. It, yeah, it would have gotten people's attention. Eventually, they settled on World Tour Golf. 
And I think that meant we had to add some overseas courses. And uh, I guess we learned from our, our last experience because finishing this one was actually pretty easy. Although there's a lot, there was a lot of stuff, a lot of different machines to test on in the IBM world. But also everybody kind of understood if things didn't quite work right. That was a great game. We enjoyed it. I enjoyed doing it. I, I have not played golf recently, but until my uh, uh, father-in-law and uh, uncle-in-law uh, became too uh, decrepit to play, I would play with them probably twice a year. And it was, it was a good lifelong skill. And I did spend a lot of time with Trip and other people from EA on the golf course where you learn interesting things about people. <laughs> and there's the reason golf is the, the sport they play right Business. yeah well well who who will and and i do not want i i'm not speaking of anyone whose name i've mentioned i'm going to say that right up front who will kick their ball out of the rough who will kick their ball out from behind a tree who gets angry enough to throw a club <laughs> who 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 says who, who assumes that a two-foot putt is a tip-in? These are things that tell you about people you're playing with. Good. I'm frankly surprised that business people play it because our, my guess is that you give away more than you get, but maybe, maybe they always think they're learning more about the other guy. Hmm. You know, it's, it's always makes me think with games like that. And I know you've worked on some other sports games and I'll talk to George about this a little bit too. You know, with his experiences, but trying to find that balance between like what's what's realistic, what feels like the actual thing versus what's, well, first of all, what can you accurately represent given the technology, but also what's, what, what's fun? <laughs> well, exactly. So the, so the first thing, and uh, uh, Harvey, not Paul, Ray, Ray Harvey, who I worked with at, for at Rocket Science, said, you gotta find the 90%. There is something somebody's gonna be doing in this game 90% of the time and it had better be fun. And that's the first thing you need to find. Hmm. And so fun comes first, the first realism thing. comes second. And especially at this era where we are dealing with pixel arrays that are 160 by 120 in 16 colors, and we may not get to pick the 16 colors. <laughs> Um, realism is not really, visual realism is, isn't likely. Now, yes, in theory, I could have built a very realistic golf model, ball flight model. And I'm pretty sure that the guy who did the other golf game I mentioned, Henry, uh, damn it, old, can't remember his name. Anyway, uh, I'm pretty sure he had a very realistic golf model, but he also had an interface that had you hit like seven buttons to swing. Whoa. So there are all kinds, the, the, the places that people interact with the systems, they're limited. In, real, in VR, we can kind of do a real swing now. Mm -hmm. But short of holding the, those, before the Wii, there was no way you could do a decent realistic golf swing in a game. There just wasn't. The interface space isn't there. The interface space is still not there for a good martial arts game. A good generic Eastern martial arts game. And by which I mean any game that allows you to kick. Mm -hmm. Boxing, not so bad. But if you can't use your feet and the, the neither the Wii nor the Quest or any other machine I'm familiar with, track your feet. You can't kick. Some, you, you can't do a wonderful spinning rear kick, spinning kick, and you know, smack somebody in the head. So realism comes in all kinds of places, but fun is what matters. And there is a there is a subset of people who care more about realism than they do about fun. Uh, I'm pretty sure the term came from board gaming, grognards. And uh, for some of the time I was developing games, they thought grognards were their market, but there aren't very many grognards. So fun is more important than real. 
That's just an, uh, I, I think that's an undeniable fact. I don't think I knew the, what that term meant before now. <laughs> so grognard is somebody who's sort of obsessive about the realism. Yeah, they're the people who who read, and I will admit, I was one of these people. They're the people who read the the characteristics of the armor in the back of Panzerblitz, the Panzerblitz manual, and go, you know, we know this was wrong. This is wrong now. The ground pressure on this vehicle is not four point two; it's four point eight. <laughs> I think I know the type. <laughs> I'm sure you do. Um, so, so we were not thinking in terms of realism we were thinking in terms of fun but on golf there are some real elements in it the animation is hand drawn by paul from video of me swinging uh and i remember him making a very big deal about the pronation of one foot showing because that's really important to indicate how weight is being transferred and i'm like okay paul whatever <laughs> Yeah, this... um, so yeah, they're all they're all hand drawn, but a a, a video reference was used, uh, as happened later for us on uh, on Champions, sort of. Um, so it's got to be, I guess the term is uh, verisimilitude, a suspension of disbelief. Verisimilitude. That's the word. Well, yeah. let's, uh, we got a couple last ones I wanted to see if we could get to here. Uh, Centurion, I think that was next, right? Um, yes, there was a failed project in between. One of the reasons I know I'm not a designer. Paul, um, I'm trying to think of the exact sequence here. I got a real job. And so Paul started working with another programmer. Mm -hmm. And so when that job proved to be not fun, I came back to the business and uh, tried to develop a product and failed. Uh, technology I could develop, product not so much. And so EA put us together with Kellen Beck, who had been a star designer for Cinemaware. Oh, one yeah. Of, yeah, one of the many efforts to bring computer games and movies together. And they want somebody to compete with the Cinemoria games. And so we... Uh... It's interesting, because that's what I was thinking of when I was looking at some of these screenshots, was it kind of reminded me of uh, Defender of the Crown a little bit. Absolutely. And, yes, and Kellen was the designer of Defender of the Crown. And as I said, Kellen was a very different kind of designer to work with, which made for a little bit of friction, but he he gave us some good stuff and you know, let us let us make suggestions and and incorporated them when they were good and really was was not nearly as difficult to work with as i was afraid a new designer was going to be especially one that did not live in the bay area because we were still in the bay area and kellen lived in portland so we only met face to face maybe once a month over the course wow. of the game it couldn't have been easy um, it was it was really different and uh, again, I, I, but I, I got to start on this game using the graphics code I developed for World Tour Golf. And uh, this game, it's like, like the Cinemawares, this game, Cinemaware games, this game is broken into pieces. And I'm sure I can't name them all now, but you've got the overall map game, you've got battle, you've got chariot racing, you've got gladiatorial combat, there's a uh, 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 sea battle and uh, uh, and uh, negotiation and uh, diplomacy. So Nikki, Nikki and I broke those up between us. Ambitious. Uh, yeah, well, it, it sort of felt like it. and But it was fun and it let us build individual pieces and sort of plug them in. The, uh, the conversations here are all pre-scripted. There's no, there's no artificial intelligence or, or processing going on or here. There's just a big tree that Kellen built and we implemented, uh, relatively straightforward. The, uh, because of the, the differing levels of graphic performance and capability among the machines we were targeting just on the PC, we've got different set, different graph, essentially everything has 
multiple versions of, of the graphic for four color, 16 color, 256 color, um, EGA, which is the same set of colors, but it's organized differently. And so most of what you're looking at here, yeah, this is sort of the basic where you'll look at the edges of the uh, tablet and they're just clean lines. They're just drawn. They're not uh, actually art. That's sort of the baseline. And then they'll be on, on better displays. They look a little like weathered stone. Hmm. So that shows you the, a different level. Now, if you look at the starting game image, I will give you a clue as to where the... Um, this one or the wolf? No, the, no, actually the, it, it was labeled, back to the guy, the fourth, the one on the far right labeled starting game, uh, upper right corner. So there are about two pixels on this screen, which if you click on them, will bring up a message, a, an Easter egg message about asterisk and obelix. Uh, uh, Gaul was divided into three parts. No, four parts. One lone village still, still held out against the invaders. Um, and like I said, uh, 15 years after we, we published the game, somebody found that and put it, put it up on YouTube. Okay. Um, there's probably some folks that'll want to try to see if they can find it. Is that on all the versions or just the DOS? Oh, no, no, it's on all the versions. As, well, as far as I know, it's on all the versions. Nikki did the uh, uh, the Amiga port, so it's there. Uh, did I do a common report of this? I don't know. I don't think so. Um, it looks like there's a Amiga FM Towns Genesis. Yeah, so, oh, I did the Genesis port. So, yes, it's in that. Um, oh, the Genesis um, yeah, I did the Genesis port, which was my first exposure to a real console, if you don't consider the Atari a console. Um, and they were, EA was doing their development without Sega's help. They had a clean room and they had taken the machines apart and were figuring out how they worked. And so um, I held them up in the, the contract negotiations for basically a clean room fee. So this is going to be really annoying to build. You're going to pay me extra to do it. I don't remember how much it was, but they paid it. And two weeks later, they made a deal with Sega and I still got the money. So I was <laughs> reasonably happy about that negotiation. Uh, so these machine, these games, the, the port, the Amiga port was developed on the Amiga. Uh, the Sega port was developed on the IBM PC using tools, both from Sega and Electronic Arts that allowed us to talk to the Sega and, and work remotely. And EA developed those tools over a lot of years and they they did them tremendous service over at least a decade. And for all I know, they're still using their descendants mm. as opposed to uh, uh, development tools made by the, the console makers, which are generally, during the time I was working on consoles were generally pretty awful. So yeah, this was a this was a fun a fun project. Uh, people complained. I know that some some reviewers complained about the the football play nature of the the land battles, but uh, I thought it was a, a reasonable interpretation and saved us from having to uh, uh, do a lot smarter system. I contrast it with uh, Modem Wars, hmm. which uh, Danny Button developed about the same time, which was a one-on-one, -on -one, very similar battlefield, one-on-one -on -one, uh, across a modem. You may find it listed as Modem Wars or Sport of War. I can't remember. I think the publication was Modem Wars. So the, the first, yeah, that's it. The first interpretation uh, by Danny of her intense interest in uh, networked gaming. And so it's not, the, the system is, the, the essential view is not dissimilar, but we went a little further with the football play and Modem Wars goes more with the individual orders play. Not a whole lot of screenshots here. Oh, there's some. Um, it's actually, it's a it's a very simple. In terms of gameplay, it's very similar. This is the screen. 
um, pretty much. And you've got your unit types and you've got your battles. They're, they're artillery, infantry, and cavalry, um, a spy, and your headquarters. So five unit types, two three types of terrain, um, forest, river, hills. Um, and it's, it's really a very pure game of me against you, my strategy against your strategy. And I thought it was genius. I played it a whole lot with uh, other people at, at EA. Played a lot of mule. It's, oh yeah, yeah. The, the failure of modems from a commercial point of view is that you need, modems were not widespread and you need an opponent. Yeah, when was when did this come out? This was 80, uh, says there. 89. Yeah, That's 89. Not, yeah, so there would be not that many people that would be able to play this. Yeah, especially not on uh, the Commodore 64, which I think is where it came out first. But we had a we had a, a good collection that at EA of people who had modems. And so we, we played it a lot and uh, it was. I'm jealous. <laughs> it, it was, it was, it was, it was groundbreaking. We thought, we felt it was groundbreaking at the time. And I still think it was, and I think it was probably ahead of its time. Um, you know, she comes up all the time in these interviews because she's just such a original. Oh, creative and... uh, I, I, yeah, I just... feel bad about doing this no matter how bad I do it, but I'm going to first Dan and then Danny was a freaking genius in terms of game design vision. And uh, I'm afraid not nearly as much of a genius in terms of commercial success, which is completely unfair, but mule and uh uh, Motomores and uh, the, the cities of gold. Heart of Africa, Seven Cities of Gold and its follow-up Heart, Heart of Africa. Um, I know that, that Danny was not happy doing Heart of Africa, but it was, it was a moneymaker after Seven Cities of Gold. Seven Cities of Gold was also a technological breakthrough, but they were just, they were, they were fantastic designs. They were fun. They were informative. They Mule teaches you things about economics that you never know it's teaching you until you take an economics class. Mm -hmm. um, and the so yeah, um, yeah. Danny was a genius, and as many geniuses are, um, a little weird, a little tortured, maybe even, and uh, and died way too young. Mm. And that is a shame. Uh, the, 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 to the interview her, but yeah, when well, when my first physical introduction to Danny was at a convention, and Dan, and again, there, there's no way I know that it's supposed to be culturally acceptable to do it to say these things, but Dan was a serious geek. He was tall. He was skinny. He was gangly. He just never seemed at home in his body, although he was a great public speaker. Um, his, his, his memorable uh, presentation on why there should not be game design awards, because game developers should not be required to compete against each other like dogs, was amazing. And physically, again, physically so, he used what he had. And in the lobby, walked this six foot tall ringleted Southern Belle, all just all in red, um, graceful and confident and so many things that Dan had not been, hmm. that it was, it was impossible to say that this had been a bad decision. <laughs> um, and I remember sitting with Danny and Nikki and talking, and at one point, um, Nikki did something, and Danny said, "Do that again. I want to see how you did how you do that." And 
the upshot of it was, which was fascinating to me, you have a man and a woman in a skirt, man in pants, woman in skirt, sitting next to each other, and you toss something toward their laps, they will respond entirely differently. A man will bring his knees together to reduce the amount of space that the thing can fall through. A woman who is used to wearing a skirt will spread her knees apart mm. to create a basket from her skirt for something to land in. And Danny had noticed Nikki doing this and the contrast between what she did and what I did and wanted to know how to do it the right way. So she brought the same sort of sensibility to her transition that she brought to figuring out the fun stuff in a game. Which to me was really astounding. I would have thought if you'd ever asked me before I saw her do it, I would have thought that those would be completely different pieces of your head. Hmm. Um, but alas, she was a creature. She was a designer for the wide open spaces where you could do lots of different things. And it, you, it, was, it was hard for her to be constrained to a set of genres that were becoming popular and that the companies wanted to do. And it, it's a shame, I think, that the companies could not look at her and see her genius and just say, we're going to publish this stuff. We don't know how it's going to do because nobody does. And maybe a bunch of them will fail, but some of them will create new vistas. They'll create blue water for us. I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed that nobody saw how to do that. You know, just thinking with, you know, with, I grew up playing mule with my family, you know, we'd pass the joysticks around, you know, and yeah. there's never been a game that quite scratched that itch for me again, you know, it's just a sort of unique thing. And like so many of her games are like that. I agree. I absolutely agree. And the first computer game I ever played was computer quarterback mm -hmm. when I was at TSR. I don't remember who. Um, uh, it was definitely not Brian. There was Brian, Kevin, there was at least a third Bloom brother. Anyway, one of the Bloom brothers had an, uh, an Apple III. And sometimes we would go over and we would play computer quarterback. And computer quarterback was really interesting. I, it, it's, it's a text-based football game. And you play it and you select plays and you you select offenses and you select defenses and it tells you what happens. And at the end of the third quarter, it says, my circuits are something along these lines. My circuits are overheating. That's the one. Um, my circuits are overheating. Go get a cup of coffee while I cool down. And it takes five or 10 minutes and comes back to play. And then in the fourth quarter, it kicks your freaking ass. <laughs> Because what it was doing was figuring out how you, what you had, what your play selection was in various circumstances. And, and we tested this by deliberately playing one way during the first three quarters, like running on first, running on first down all the time, say. And then changing it up in the fourth quarter and say passing on first down and blowing it completely away because it had decided it knew how you were going to play and you could take it, you could metagame that and take yeah. advantage of that fact. But still, uh, a genius moment that it took the opportunity to figure out how you were playing as a good opposing coach would and adjust. And although this, I know the screen shows strategic simulations, Dan was the designer on that. Or Danny was the designer on that, I guess is right, is more correct. Yeah. So well, we've got one game we need to cover still. Okay. <laughs> kind of a nice segue, I think. Mutant League. Oh my God, yes. So. I was one of the technical directors 
on this product because I was a hockey fish. I was a hockey fan. I had tickets for the Sharks. Um, and this was so much fun. Yeah, this is just so much fun. Um, you didn't leave. And, yeah. Well, this As was, a technical first was director, like football, I, and then this was hockey, I think. Was it? Yeah, there was, there was Mutant League football. Um, and they were based on uh, on a board game whose name is escaping me, as every other name has so far today. Um, and uh, yeah, Bones Jackson, Bo Jackson. Um, <laughs> yes, and, yeah, it's full, it's full of stuff like that. Uh, the ad for it was hilarious because it was a, it was a picture of an ice rink with a head, a, a, a severed head on it. And, and the text was, there's a face off at center ice. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't, sometimes we're they have long, heads on here. I don't see it this time. Yeah. We're, we're a long way from TSR being worried about gently poking her with their swords. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, this is, uh, I believe I was the technical director for the Sega version. I don't know if there was any other version. Um, which means that the technical director job was sort of a weird job. I, I said at the time it was one third project manager, one third firefighter, and one third technical assistance. So if somebody had a, 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 a really intractable bug, we might work on that. If somebody had, uh, uh, you know, we're having scheduling problems, we would work with them on that. Uh, if somebody's lead engineer got hit by a bus, we might be asked to go finish a project. Uh, it was that kind of a job. And, and in a lot of ways, I loved it. Um, I spent about a year at, uh, at EA doing that before uh, Steve, now Siobhan Beeman, and Ellen Guan hired me away to do development for Illusion Machines. But uh, yeah, it was, uh, that was, I, I, I mean, in that year, I worked on probably 40 projects. So they kind of run together. Mm. But uh, oh, yeah, because the, we, you weren't full time on any of them. You were helping a lot of people get their stuff done. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I do remember this one as being one of the more fun games, the one of the ones I spent more time on. I don't recall that it had any technical issues that I really had to deal with. Um, getting, uh, getting submissions ready for Sega or Nintendo uh, or, uh, or Microsoft for their consoles is a, a twitchy process and you've got to do it just right. And so having somebody who does it for a living instead of asking each team to do it is is very sensible and we did some of that um I had a question from sent in by matt shergy about this game he was wondering is, were there plans for to do other sports yes yes the theory was that this was going to be a, a new line and uh, i assume that it did not work out financially hmm. but they're they're obvious uh, obvious possibilities in in every major sport basketball um uh, lacrosse. Uh, I, I was thinking. Uh, I was thinking uh, uh, soccer, actually, uh -huh. but even golf. Uh, golf with landmines on the field and and uh, and uh, uh, giant uh, ant traps, like in Star Wars, um, devoured by the the the, uh, the monster for a thousand years. Um, yeah, you could have done a whole lot with this. And uh, I'm guessing it just wasn't, in my opinion, early on, EA did not fully grasp, I'm not sure anyone did, the distinction between the computer game market and the console market. And I, I think they brought, they brought the computer game market to the console and that was not as successful as bringing the console market to the console. And even when they tried to do console type games, I'm Sh Shaq Fu, I'm looking at you. Um, I, I do not believe that they were tremendously successful when they tried to work in that genre of say platformers um, or uh, sports game. I mean, they were really popular. Uh, NHL, NHL 94 was, was big in every house I know. And, and this is 
you're looking at that, but it, it didn't, didn't cross over. Hmm. Well, Mr. Raff, the end of the, I'll go ahead. Sorry. At the end of the day, I, I, I made a lot of fun of being Gordon for saying this once, and I still will under certain circumstances, but at the end of the day, the point is, here is to make money. And so it, when I said to Bing, how do you know if this is a good game? And he said, by how much it sells, um, there is, there's an unfortunate realism in that, uh -huh. that if you, if you don't sell games, you can't keep making games. And while I, as a gamer and a designer and a technical person can say that, oh, I think this game has a really interesting design or a great concept. The technology is, the technology is far and away, but if it does not put all those things together to make something that someone, that a lot of people want, um, it's, it's tough to support making more games like that, especially if you're, the biggest game company in the world and need to feed all those people. And I kind of wish the world were not like that. But yeah, I think we all do. <laughs> but we but the indie the indie world now is you know, I can publish an RPG now uh, with no financial backing. I can do every bit of the uh, layout to binding and I can, I can send it off to Amazon. And if I get good artwork done, it looks as good as the D&D book. And if I'm an indie game developer, I can develop a small scale or, or tightly controlled or clever game product. And I can put it on Steam. So in a lot of ways, the world is better now than it used to be. The reality is that the vast majority of money goes to the people at the top of the, the marketing heap. And it's not just because they spend a lot of money advertising things. It's because they spend a lot of time and effort crunching into, crunching what they see people want into what they make. There's an old saying, the customer is always right. In MBA classes, they will teach you that that's only sort of true because customers can only say they like what they've seen. And if you show them something new that they really want, but they never knew they wanted it, that's real success. But that is very unreliable and difficult to do. And when a AAA game costs $10 million to make, and honestly, I have no idea what a game costs these days, but I would not be shocked if uh, every year's NHL now costs $10 million to make. Um, you can't really afford to not be as sure with it as you can be. It's understandable. Would I love to give Paul Ritchie a AAA game budget and say, start from the beginning and build the coolest thing you can think of. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'd love to. 80 million, apparently. 80? For a 80? Big, 8 zero? Typical, yeah, typical big budget AAA game costs $80 million. Wow. Wow. I guess I should not be shocked. I worked on um, I worked on a couple of low, low single digit million dollar games before I left the business. And so, yeah. So yeah, would I love to tell Paul Ritchie, we're gonna give you an $80 million budget and you build the coolest damn thing you can think of? Uh, yeah, I would love to do that, but I don't think I'd stay in business very long because I think when he hit, he'd hit really big, but I don't know that he'd hit the first time or the second time or the third time if he was building something outside of the norm. You know, I was thinking one of the examples that always comes to my mind with this is the game Minecraft. Yes. And who would have looked at that, you know, with a sort of publisher's eye and thought, oh, this is definitely going to be this mega, you know, hit. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. And and there are people who will tell you that they knew it the moment they saw it, but they are probably lying. Yeah, I think so too. 
Um, and there's also just, there's survivorship bias and luck is if you're, if you're not actually building it, it's easy to say, I knew that would be good. You're building it. You, if you're building it, you've really got the skin in the game. And yeah, you really believe this was good. That, that's not just a throwaway comment. <laughs> I was at uh, Amazon when Amazon uh, started building whatever they ended up calling their, their uh, 3D system. They tried to buy from Unity. They tried to buy Unity. And we are talking a big number. And Unity wouldn't sell. And uh, That would have been interesting. Well, would have. Um, but one of the things that happened is, at the time, the aforementioned Bing Gordon, who was at EA and who held the first chair of game design at USC, I believe, was on the board of Amazon. I ran into him for the first time in like 20 years. I literally ran into him in an elevator. It's like, Bing? Evan? It's like, forget where I'm going, I'm getting in. Um, and so we talked up and down and I was right next door to the team that was investigating moving into the 3D game space for Amazon. And I went to them and I said, look, you gotta talk to Bing. You've got this resource. And they're like, who's Bing? Bing Gordon, gave him a little, little crazy. He's on our board, okay? So he's available to you. There is probably no one in the business. When he was at EA, no matter what his position was, we called him the VP of cool <laughs> because he knew better than anyone else what you could do to a game to make it cool and sell. And they're like, we really don't want board scrutiny. Like, do you want to be a success? Do you want to know, do you want to have somebody advising you who knows more about the games business than anyone in this company, any five people in this company? I could not convince them. Uh, and so they built Lumberyard, which I'm sure the Nadis are using it. And I'm, uh, I'm doubtful that any major company is using it. Uh, Amazon builds cool tech. Amazon is a technology company and they build cool stuff, but we, I'll say we, we don't, we often don't know what we don't know about what we're building when I was there. Uh, you, they, they don't, we did, we did not always acquire experts to build new technology. I was put on a team to, <coughs> excuse me, to build uh, uh, analytics for Android games. There were five, six of us. None of us had ever developed for Android. None of us had ever utilized the big data systems into which we were going to be flushing all this information. Um, to, to the extent I was the senior engineer and to the extent that I did a bunch of research and I, I built a presentation that was basically, this is a standard big data uh, pipeline. And this is the most popular tool used in each space in this pipeline. And I brought it to my boss and I said, okay, here you go. And he said, okay, so this is what we're gonna do. Uh, do we know these are gonna work? And I said, no, none of us have ever used any of these. What happens if this one doesn't work? I said, the next one on that, the next one for that particular piece is so-and-so. He said, what happens if that doesn't work? Well, the next one after that is so-and-so. He said, do you have two backups for every one of these technologies? I said, yes, none of us have ever built with any of these technologies, we don't know how they work. We don't know if they do work. We don't know if they're suitable for what we're doing. Now, it turned out that our first choice, we made all of our first choices work. But a team that had done some of these things before would have done it faster and better. Amazon is all of, Amazon's technology is largely about good enough. Hmm. And from the very beginning of my life in games, good enough was never. Um, it, was, it was a hard transition to make. Um, and, and, and we always, we wrote an assembly because you needed it to get into the machines. Later on, we got to write most of the game in C, but we still wrote the tough parts in assembly. And now you write the tough parts in 
GPU code, which I don't understand at all, but functionally speaking, you're getting down on the hardware. So the hardware will do what you want as fast as freaking possible because good enough isn't. And uh, that's, we've gotten to the point where the machines are, are, are powerful enough now that for a lot of things, good enough is, but not for you know, AAA product. You always got to be at the edge. RPGs were a lot easier that way. Dice don't vary that much. <laughs> That's some great quotes there. Quotables. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, I think I won't take up any more of your time today. It sounds like we got enough. We could probably could do another whole show. You know, <laughs> it is it is conceivably possible. I know how to talk. Um... <laughs> I got a good friend of mine that would love to talk to you. He's got a radio show. Um, I I. I, I don't object if you want to give my contact information. Oh, that's the I, I, yeah, I, I have opinions. And I know how to talk and I'm willing to share. <laughs> okay. Well, I think that's probably about as good a spot as we can for, <laughs> for now. <laughs> anyway, thanks right. for coming on the show. It's been fantastic. Wow. Well, you are very welcome, and I enjoyed myself. I really appreciate you having me, and, and I will shout out to Sue for putting the two of us together. Excellent. Well, I'm, like I say, I think I think I'll have you back on. <laughs> so there's feel free, feel for, free to contact me for more stuff. But anyway, for now, thanks again. I'll, you know, good luck with whatever you're working on these days. I am working on absolutely nothing. I retired out of Amazon. Uh, It'll be nine years this November, and uh, I am I am happily living a life of leisure and wishing that the world was a little different than it actually is. Well, you'd mentioned how easy it is for people to self-publish stuff these days, and <laughs> that's that's true. That's true. And I, and I have a project covered in the, in the drawer. Do you have a drawer full of ideas? That you I I have I have one big one. Um, do you, Do you mind me taking a few minutes to tell oh. you about it? Okay, go ahead. Okay, so there's this guy at Cornell University by the name of Peter Turchin, T-U-R-C-H-I-N. And he is trying to develop what he calls uh, cle uh, cleoma cleometrics, which is a mathematical uh, uh, system of history. And his, his initial presentation was a very simple computer model that predicted what political entity owned every 10 by 10 square of land in Europe and Asia over the 3000 years from 1500 BC to 1500 AD with about 80% accuracy. Mm. Really simple, really simple algorithm, very respectable, interesting results. And I believe that this technology could be used to generate uh, histories for fantasy worlds and RPGs. Cleometrics. Cleometrics, cleonomics, cleometrics, I think is the right uh, oh, right word. Cleo being the muse of history. I'll show you what I'm looking at here so you can verify that. Yes, that's it. That is it. And so, um, yeah, if Peter Turchin isn't in there, we need to rewrite this. We need to add to this. Uh, um, Article. I can send you a. Uh, oh, sorry. Clear dynamics. Clear dynamics. Turchin is clear dynamics. Um, and uh, yeah, so you could take, in theory, if David you. Turchin. Turchin, yeah, that's the guy. Uh, you could take any fantasy world map drawing program, add a very light layer of data underneath it and run Turchin's model or something like it to produce a history of the rise and fall of polities for as long as you want to. You want a thousand year history of this piece of land, who ran it, what language they spoke, when, how they, did they, did they get it by battle or, or did the old order just fall apart and they just kind of walked in you, you could do all of that. 
like an excellent tool for any kind of world building. Exactly, exactly. And I kind of, I, it's it, it's been rolling around in my head for a few years, but the fact of the matter is that something about working at Amazon finally made programming not fun. My whole, my whole life before that, if I went on vacation for more than two weeks, I would have a programming project somewhere to work on. And I have barely coded since I left Amazon. Last year, or I guess two years ago now, I, I worked up some, some Python to uh, give me data about how COVID was progressing. But it's just, I, it's almost like I'm not a programmer anymore. And so it remains an idea that I, I kind of futz around with on paper, maybe someday. Well, hopefully not too long. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe that's somebody will really say, wow, fun. that's a great idea. That, let, that, that's a great idea. Do, do you mind if I steal it? It's like, for the record, no, I do not mind if you steal it. I'd love it if you talk to me about it. If you want, if somebody wants to build it, I'd love it if you talk to me about it so that I can contribute what I think I know. But uh, I would just like to see it reach fruition. Uh, so thank you for that extra time for to, I think to run my problem. elevator pitch. <laughs> yeah, right. maybe do a Kickstarter. Yeah, maybe. Well, if any of you got any plans, you know, let me know. We'll have you back on. I will. That would be. I, I will. All right. Well, thanks again. Right. You're welcome. Bye bye. Boom. That's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, as always, I want to thank you. Yes, you. Yes, you. Yes, you. <laughs> thank you very, 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 very much for making this show possible, guys. Thank you. There would be no mad chats. There would be none of this without you and your support. Uh, now, we're coming up on episode 500. You know what? Nine more episodes left. Uh, so I got some cool uh, interviews in, already in the pipes uh, to get us there. A lot of folks been asking me, you know, what are your what are your plans for that? What are you going to do with Matt Chat afterward? And I got to say again, it just depends on you guys. You know, how much uh, you know? Do you like the show? Do you want to see the this continue? Uh, maybe even uh, increase, <laughs> improve. <laughs> you know, I was thinking, you know, if I could, uh, you know, the main reason that there's not a show every week. You know, I used to do weekly shows. It's just the time it takes, the stuff that you don't see, the behind-the-scenes stuff, trying to get people, trying to arrange a time. I mean, you'd be amazed how much back and forth there is in all these different time zones and such. Uh, but if I had a little more support, you know, then I could have, uh, you know, hire somebody, basically, uh, to do that kind of stuff for me. I already got some people in mind uh, that I'd like to talk to about that. But we could be pumping these shows out, you know, every week instead of every two weeks. But, you know, I'm going to need your help to do that. So, you know, if you if you can't do it, don't worry about it. You know, thank you for whatever you're able to contribute. Uh, appreciate that. But, you know, on the other hand, if you've got some uh, extra funds, maybe you're one of those Bitcoin billionaires or whatever the case may be, <laughs> uh, and you want more Mad Chat, well, just go to that little link in the Patreon. Uh, go to that little Patreon link there and uh, up the ante a little bit. You know, if you're giving a buck, uh, give two bucks. You, know, you probably won't notice much difference, but you know, if enough people do that, hey, you know, maybe uh, Matt Chat's best days are ahead of it. Who knows? But anyway, uh, I don't want to get greedy here, but uh, or sound uh, unappreciative for what you're already contributing. So thanks you again. All right, what about that news from the Met Cave? Let's see what we've got. Uh, first off, a bit of sad news. This is from Miko. Uh, you probably played Baldur's Gate 2. If you haven't, just stop this video. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Seriously, if you haven't ever played that, what the heck? Go play it. Uh, anyway, back to the sad news. Uh, David Warner, he was the actor who played the voice of John Arrhenicus, and he's got that fabulous voice. I mean, he couldn't have picked a better better actor in my opinion uh, i didn't know too much about this guy 
other than his uh, involvement with that. But he's done a bunch of other stuff. He was in Titanic, Star Trek VI. He used to play the Chancellor in that, Klingon. Uh, the Omen, and a whole bunch of other stuff. So it is, uh, you know, he was 80 years old. So, you know, he didn't, you know, he didn't die young exactly, but still sad. Uh, so best wishes to him and his family. And, you know, thank you uh, for all the fabulous work you've done. All right, and then Snap Snapper, Snappy Snap. Uh, you know, there's a little crawfish place down in uh, Louisiana where I grew up. And <laughs> uh, I think it's called Catfish Charlie's, I want to say. Uh, but anyway, when you uh, order your fish or your shrimp or whatever you're getting there, uh, if you want to make it spicy, you say, make it snappy. And then they get snappy snappy if you want it, you know, super, super hot. I, I think just a regular snappy is probably good. <laughs> You know, for those of us with a little bit of Louisiana uh, in our blood, you know, we kind of like a little, a little pepper, a little Tony's on the old, uh, old fish basket. But anyway, I always think about that when I look at Snap Snapper's handle on Discord. Uh, anyway, he's been keeping us updated on this Might and Magic 7 mod. As you know, if you've ever watched the show before, huge. I'm a personally huge fan of Might and Magic 7. Uh, one of my favorite games of all time. Love it. Uh, and it's, so I'm really kind of interested in this modding project. Uh, I thought it was just kind of a straight up mod, you know, update the interface, bring it to a new engine, etc. But he's actually, it looks like he's adding quite a bit of new stuff to this. This is Henrik. I'm going to try to get him on the show, we'll see how that goes. Sometimes they never, sometimes they just don't respond, you know. <laughs> like, here's this Matt Barton guy. Huh? Uh, maybe he can get him to come on because he's got new dungeons planned, towns, monsters, quests. Uh, and he's also got a Patreon page, uh, so I don't, want to, <laughs> I don't know how thin you're stretched after your Met Chat support, but if you got a little extra, you know, pop on over to his Patreon page, support these efforts, uh, so we can get this Might Magic 7 mod maybe a little bit faster, a little bit better. So I anyway, thought I would shout that out to the uh, the fans. Uh, and then also Christian Daly, uh, I believe he's worked on some... Uh, what did he work on? I, just, I was just looking at the list. I'm wanting to say it was some uh, uh, some D&D related titles. Uh, anyway, he's announced a new studio based in Austin, Texas called Skeleton Key. Now, this is a new studio. They're supposed to be into scary games. Uh, passion for play is what motivates us in our desire to create amazing interactive experiences. <laughs> so a little bit vague, maybe. You know, I, I, I sent him a I tweeted as well to see if we could get him on the show to talk a little bit more about this project. But, you know, it sounds like they're hiring pretty much at all levels. So if you want to get a job in the games industry, you've watched a lot of Matt Chats, you know your stuff, uh, you might want to ping these guys and see if you, uh, you know, they might be interested. Yeah, you moved to Austin, Austin, Texas. Got a sweet job working on something innovative. You know, sounds pretty cool to me. Uh, and then last but not least, you might remember a game called Swords and Sorcery. Uh, they've got a new trailer for the sequel to that. It's called Swords and Sorcery Sovereign. Well, it's looking really good. They got a, a release date of December 2nd. <laughs> they call this uh, Games for Geezers, I think, is the, the catchphrase for this. Uh, you know, I don't know. You know, it obviously looks a little bit uh, retro, uh, shall we say, but who cares? You know, no, it's, it's all about the gameplay, the, uh, the mechanics, to some extent, the storyline. You know, just how fun is it to kill a rat in the game? You know, it's always my... Top question when looking at something like this, you know, good graphics can help. You know, they can, I would say, you know, good graphics can make a good game better, but they can't make a terrible game playable. You know, I really just uh, <laughs> feel pretty strongly about that. All right, what about that ale of the week? Oh, yeah. Well, I don't know how we're going to top that ale we had last time. What was it? The, the Darkness Russian Imperial Stout. But i kind of been on this, uh, you know, kind of going for darker darker brews lately and I found this one you know at the local uh, establishment it's a goose island I don't know, what is that one they do it's a goose island I'm blanking on the name they do some pretty famous uh, brews that are pretty widely available I just can't think of it off the top of my head but uh, anyway I'm familiar with the name uh, this is a bourbon county brand stout it's a stout aged in bourbon barrels so you get a little bit of bourbon flavor which I always appreciate Chicago May 2021, Imperial Stout. A real nice bottle. I don't know if you can make it out. It's kind of, you kind of have to uh, <laughs> be up close to it, but uh, it is attractive. You know, it's not just a label here. They've actually sort of uh, imprinted on the bottle, if you know what I mean, kind of raised uh, lettering. 
Uh, so that looks sweet. Now, I don't know if we got too much other stuff here. It says it contains wheat. Oh boy. <laughs> Notes of vanilla, toffee, chocolate, burnt sugar, and dried fruit. It says to enjoy it in a snifter. <laughs> in a snifter. So I have to settle for my famous drinking horn. Um, anyway, I don't see a whole lot of other stuff to go on here. It's a room temperature, which is, you know, as you guys pointed out, that's, uh, you know, typically where, you, you know, how you want a good stout, sort of the darker beers. You don't necessarily want those ice cold. <laughs> I'm kind of, uh, I'm sort of warming up, uh, pun intended, I guess, to this idea of uh, not refrigerating your beer, or at least uh, not ales like this, because I think it kind of messes with the flavor a little bit. Maybe it's, uh, you don't want it hot, you know, obviously, but a you know, nice room temperature, keep it in the basement. You know, I think it's where you want to be with these. At least that's the opinion that I'm forming these days. Anyway, enough uh, chatter. Let's get the thing open and see what it's all about. Kind of miss those. I'm going to get some more of those beers that have those funny cork tops. You know, it's always fun to try to hit the camera with those. You know, one of these days I'm going to hit it. Oh, boy. Am I going to be able to get this open? Maybe I should use, uh, it looks like a twist off. Oh, well, use the shirt method. Oh, oh, maybe it's not a twist off. You know what? I don't. It looks like a twist off, but oh well. <laughs> That's what I got my handy dandy Predator bottle opener for. Okay, that did the trick. Oh, pretty nifty. Love the Predator. You know, great series of movies. I like, uh, you know, both of them. Is there a third one? Anyway, I definitely like the first one the best, obviously, but the you know the second one's not bad. Okay, let's pour a little bit of here into Ozzy. My Ozzy Osbourne glass. Get a look at the color on this. Uh, not surprisingly, quite dark. Nice uh, coppery bubbles on this, the foam. Nice bit of head. Oh, wow, this smells amazing. Ah. Oh. Oh, I wish you guys could smell this. Ah, just, man, you could make an air freshener. You don't even need to drink this. You could just smell it, and that would be enough pleasure <laughs> uh, for a lot of people. You're very cherry. kind of. You definitely smell that bourbon barrel uh, aspect of this, but it's really a sweet, aromatic, little bit of a... You know, I always talk about chocolate-covered cherries. You know, that's kind of what it reminds me of. It just smells really, really good. So let's get some into the drinking horn and see if it tastes as good as it smells. Oh, the drinking horn. Oh, yes. Don't you wish you had a drinking horn, folks? Yeah, you know, we got the Renaissance Festival about to kick into gear here. I might go to that. You know, I got some friends that work there. Minnesota's got a pretty nice uh, Renaissance Festival. Uh, one of the guys there that I know is a part of the Fire Dancers. <laughs> Fu uh, fire Gazi, I think, is what they call their, their act. Okay, well, let's uh, give it a taste. I don't want to spill any. Ah, wow. Uh, that's just really, really good. You definitely taste the cherry. Really chocolatey. You know, much, yeah, toffee. Uh, definitely picking up on those notes. A little bit of a coffee-like flavor to that. I think they talked about burnt sugar. Uh, not sure what that's supposed to taste like, but this is a... You know, it's really sweet, but it's not cloying. And it's just kind of a nice little balance there. A little bit of fruitiness. Just a, you know, super duper good. Let me try it again here. Mm. Oh, just so smooth. Uh, a little bit of um, a little bit. You know, I'm starting to sort of taste more of the coffee-like taste now. Uh, and that's sort of on the back end. I'll try it one more time here. Mm. Yeah, that's just super good, man. If you like, uh, now it doesn't taste anything to me like a Guinness. <laughs> <laughs> I do like Guinness, but this is a, uh, definitely a different sort of a, a taste. Uh, you know, I, I, to me it does kind of taste like an imperial, like that Russian imperial stout. It's got sort of that heavy flavor. It's uh, very sweet, but not over sweet. 
you know, I'm gonna just gonna say, I don't know how you get much better than this. <laughs> you know, not everybody likes the style, obviously, but man, if you are into these uh, uh, bourbon barrel uh, aged uh, stouts, holy cow, <laughs> you're gonna wanna seek this out. Now it's a limited edition, this says 2021 on it. The original bourbon, bourbon barrel aged stout. It's super good. Uh, I don't, you just gotta go five out of five drinking horns on this. You know, it might be a bit hard to find, but man. <laughs> you know, if you, if you have this, you definitely wanna pick this up. Maybe you pick up a couple uh, just to have for a special occasion. Cause I'm telling you, this is really something special here. Gonna give it one more, one more taste. Mm. Oh, that's good. <laughs> wow. You know, I've really been sort of, uh, you know, between this and that uh, darkness up there, these are some just super good selections here lately. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, let's wrap it up with a quote. Okay. This is a quote from a former president, Franklin D. Roosevelt. It goes something like this. When you reach the end of your rope, tie a knot in it and hang on. <laughs> I love that. Uh, anyway, hope you guys enjoyed that and see you next time.